When a young woman was found lying on her hearth rug, foaming at the mouth on New Year's Day of 1845, few would have guessed that the winding path leading up to her death would result in a mystery that would become entwined with one of the key moments in the history of communication, as well as one of the earliest cases of murder by prussic acid. In the long catalogue of Victorian poisonings, the case of Sarah Hart remains prominent not just because of its twists and turns, but equally because of its long-reaching influences on the adoption of a device that would help to shape the modern world. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, Season 7, Episode 11. I'm the host, Ben, as always. Today, before we get started, I just want to give you a quick heads up. Wednesday, the 31st of May, I'm going to be doing a live stream with Jessica Deer, who is the illustrator of all of the book covers for the Dark Histories books. And we're going to be doing a live stream where Jessica's going to be drawing the back cover of the Season 6 book, uh, like kind of live. And at the same time, sort of taking questions both on the illustration for the book covers and as well uh, you know if you want to ask me any questions or or, or you know just chat uh, we could do that as well but it, but primarily it's going to be sort of around the book covers but yeah so if you're interested in that it's going to I'll be post about it more on social media but it's going to be at 10 p.m. Uh, that's GMT time or UK summertime so um I'll put links to it and all such uh, in social media and stuff uh, on the day of the stream and yeah if you'd like to come along obviously everyone welcome hopefully we can get some you know good questions some good chat going uh yeah it's going to be really just a sort of open q and a it's quite casual um nothing too formal but yeah it should be fun so yeah let's crack on with this week's episode it's a bit of a tale of two halves this story so let's jump straight into it this is Sarah Hart murder on the telegraph cables Twenty-six years after the first British ships arrived in Australia, John Tow stepped off the Marquis of Wellington, a 653-ton merchantman carrying almost 200 convicts, and out into the warm January air of Sydney Harbour. The four-month-long trip aboard the ship had been a winding voyage and had taken him halfway around the world, stopping off in Madeira and Rio de Janeiro before winding up on the eastern shores of Australia. Amazingly, only two convicts had died on the journey but it had still been far from comfortable. By 1814, the desperate early years of instability and illness amongst the Australian colony had long since passed, and instead, with the aid of an extensive building programme overseen by Governor Lachlan Mackery, alongside the arrival of free settlers and merchants, the colony had evolved from a camp into something resembling the early foundations of a thriving town, with a population of over 6,000, nestled amongst the trees on the banks of Sydney Harbour. Eleven years earlier, in 1803, the first newspaper had been published and the first stone bridge was built a year later with a hospital, botanical gardens and a supreme court following shortly after. Four years earlier, Lachlan Mackery had been tasked with refashioning the fledgling town into more than just a penal colony and under his tenure, schools, churches, parks and public buildings were erected and a host of social reforms were put into practice as church worship and marriage were promoted, public drinking was banned and convicts that had previously trained in specific fields back in Britain were put to work in positions that would make use of their skills for the colony. With his feet on solid ground for the first time in months, Towell looked out from the bay at the windmill perched atop a hill in the distance and the collection of square, sandstone and brick houses, and he saw his future, at least for the next 14 years. Born in the parish of Adelby, in the East English county of Norfolk, 120 miles northeast of London, in 1783, John Towell was the second son of Thomas Towell, a shopkeeper in the local village. The large family weren't especially well off, but they were comfortable enough to send John to school, where he worked hard, was keen to learn and showed a certain aptitude for education, though he lacked somewhat on the social side. With bright red hair and a lazy eye, he often found himself the butt of jokes and he shied away from friendly interactions generally. After school, he worked in the family shop until his father sent him to Great Yarmouth to undertake an apprenticeship as a shopkeep that his father had organised through one of his acquaintances. Despite growing up in a relatively irreligious family setting, John fell in with a crowd known as the Religious Society of Friends, better known today under their originally derogatory name, the Quakers. Distinctive in their clothing, a long brown overcoat and wide-brimmed hat, the Quakers stemmed from a Protestant-based theology 
breaking away into their own society as part of the separatist movement in England during the 17th century, where many religious dissenters pulled away from the established practices of the Church of England. Perceived as quiet, they kept themselves to themselves and were well-mannered with many puritanical beliefs that many equated to high moral fortitude, and with several prominent Quakers proving successful in business, most viewed the practitioners as a relatively trustworthy group, if not a little peculiar in their mannerisms. After shop closing hours, John slipped into the dim, candlelit basement room that housed the Great Yarmouth Society of Friends meeting house, where he grew close to the religion that would go on to dominate his life. In 1804, at age 21, he grew tired of the small town life and he up sticks, moving to London, where he got a job as a porter for the textiles company John Jansen & Co. in Whitechapel. During the day, he worked hard to climb the career ladder and in the evenings, he joined the Quakers, attending meetings at the British Quaker headquarters in Devonshire House in Bishopsgate and expanded his social network within the religion. Tao had a problem though. Having not been born into the religion, he was never really considered a true Quaker. He could attend the meetings, he could wear the outfit and live according to the core beliefs, but until he was drafted as a fully-fledged member, he was always an outsider, and gaining membership was no easy feat in a religion with notoriously closed doors. Three years after his move to London, Tao applied to the church officials for full membership. His case was considered, debated and voted upon in a process that took almost five months, concluding in his full membership being awarded in December of 1807. Incredibly, after all the effort that he'd made to gain acceptance, his membership lasted just over a year before he was thrown out for marrying a non-Quaker. Tao had met Mary Freeman, and against the advice of his Quaker friends, decided to marry her in an Anglican ceremony, knowing very well that it was against the rules. Disowned, but not disenchanted, John continued to attend meetings regardless. After marrying Mary, he moved around London several times, taking a job as an accountant in Camden at one point, before moving to Shoreditch. During that time, he had two sons together with Mary. John Downing was born on the 1st of September in 1809, followed by William Henry just over two years later, in November of 1811. By the birth of his second son, Tao was working hard as a salesman in the pharmaceutical industry, earning enough to just about survive and keep his family's heads above water. This situation eventually led John into getting involved in the dark arts of forging banknotes. The early 19th century was something of a golden age for counterfeiters in England. Counterfeiting coins had already been a problem for decades before inexpensive one and two pound notes were introduced into the system in the late 18th century. As soon as the poor quality notes hit the streets, the counterfeiters realised an opportunity and aided by the fact that these notes were produced by individual banks rather than the Central Bank of England, forgeries flooded the markets, comprising at times almost 50% of the notes in circulation in some London districts. Sometime between 1811 and 1814, John Tao decided to hop on the wagon and try his own hand at creating wealth from thin air. Using the fake name of Mr Smith and concocting the story that he was a partner for the Quaker-owned Uxbridge Bank, Tao employed the services of a master engraver and printer named Edward Anthony Thorogood to create 500 banknotes for him. Thorogood created the plate from a single specimen note that Tao had given him as a reference, but it wasn't quite up to scratch. When Tao requested that Thorogood try again, the engraver got suspicious and decided to give Uxbridge Bank a visit, where he and the managers, who naturally had never heard of a partner named Mr Smith, quickly pulled the story apart and saw it for what it was. Rather than scrap the order altogether, however, Thorogood went back to his workshop and continued to refine his plate, printing up the 500 notes. When Tao returned and checked through the notes, a policeman waited in the back room, and as soon as money was handed over for the order, they sprang into action clapping their hands on the counterfeiter's back, just as he was making to leave. Forgery was a serious crime, and it carried a heavy punishment. After being captured for attempting to create so many fresh notes, Tao found himself staring a potential death sentence square in the face. Fortunately for him, the Quakers of the Uxbridge Bank were, like many Quakers of the time, against capital punishment, and as such, they appealed to the Bank of England to offer a plea bargain instead. If Tao would plead guilty for the lesser crime of carrying a forged note in his possession, he would be sentenced to transportation rather than the gallows. On the 22nd of February, 1814, 
John Tao was handed down a punishment of 14 years transportation to Australia. After waving goodbye to his wife and children, he spent six weeks in Newgate Prison before another six months working hard labour in England until finally his passage to Australia was booked aboard the Marquis of Wellington, a former East Indian Company merchantman sailing to the New World on the 1st of September 1814. When Tao arrived in Australia, it was to a Sydney that had already begun its transformation into a proper town, rather than just a convict colony. For those arriving in 1814, there was a certain degree of freedom allowed by the relatively enlightened governor, Lachlan Macquarie, who had been tasked with transforming the social, business and physical landscape. Convicts worked for the government as part of their sentence in the main and were encouraged to gain private work for the remaining hours of the day in order to pay for the rest of their living expenses, such as renting rooms and drinking alcohol in the taverns during the evenings. At the same time, the relative freedom was tightly meted out and convict discipline was strict. Public thrashings and chain gang labour were common punishments doled out to those that were deemed to have stepped out of line, as was prison, eventually, for those that were deemed guilty of crimes serious enough for secondary punishment. Hard work was encouraged as a standard and differing levels of accommodation, the promise of extra free time, permission to marry, tickets of leave, and even ultimate pardons, were the carrots used to dangle in front of those that wanted nothing more but to join free society at the earliest opportunity. In general, labour was divided up and handed out to those that were deemed most appropriate, and the vast majority of convicts by the time of Tower's arrival were working as assistants to the free settlers that were busy trying to carve out a new life. In later years, farmhands, clerks and labourers were commonly dished out, even to those convicts that had previously earned their freedom. Tao had not wasted his time aboard the Marquis of Wellington, and in the long evenings sailing across endless seas, he'd spent his time listening and talking to those that had some inkling of what they were to expect once they had landed in Australia. During his enrolment, he made no bones about his level of education, and he told the officials, in a fantastic display of stretching the truth, that he was an experienced druggist, landing him the somewhat comfortable work detail of assistant in the dispensary of the government-run General Hospital. Tao made the most of his time, and in quite short order got caught stealing, which landed him a year's labour at the Coal River Penal Settlement in Newcastle, a coal mine and lumber yard 100 miles north up the coast from Sydney. His time spent in Newcastle was hard, and apparently enough to teach Tao a significant lesson. Upon his return to Sydney, he was reassigned as a clerk, as an assistant to the schoolmaster, where he settled down, at least until the latter half of 1818, when he fell ill with consumption and wound up spending five months in hospital. Spending a prolonged period resting up and suffering consumption may very well have been seen as a blessing after his time in Newcastle, but it quickly became evident to Tao that government medicine and hospital care was severely lacking. This was an observation that would stick in his mind and plant the seeds of an idea that would cultivate over the dull weeks and months he spent stuck in recovery. Finally, upon his release from hospital, he applied for a ticket of leave that would allow him to be paid for his work and set him on the long path to freedom. His first effort was rejected, but only on a technicality, as it lacked the recommendation from an active clergyman. Tao worked quickly to befriend Reverend William Cowper, and before long, his ticket of leave was granted. With the new ability to earn a wage, Tao took a job as a clerk for a shipping merchant named Richard Brooks, a former convict ship captain with an unsavoury past, having been reprimanded at least twice for the high death rates of convicts during his voyages from England to Australia. Around the time of Tao's arrival in Australia, Brooks had re-established himself full-time in Sydney as a merchant and had gained the position of one of the most prominent members of the Sydney Free Settlers, helped along by his manipulation of stock prices during a temporary downturn in the settlement's economy. Tao used his time working for Brooks, gaining important experience as a merchant, before he applied for a conditional pardon in 1820. His application, together with a strong recommendation from Brooks, was successful in the first attempt, and Tao found himself more or less a free man, provided, of course, that he stayed within the boundaries of the settlement for the remaining eight years of his sentence. Tao had no plans to go anywhere anyway. He had been planning for his freedom since his time in hospital and having recognised an important niche that needed filling, he promptly went into business, opening the first retail pharmacy in Sydney. Much like when he arrived in Sydney, he bent the truth somewhat, 
alluding to a medical qualification that he did not have in his newspaper adverts, but no one questioned it, and besides, most were just happy to have the goods available. Shortly, Towel expanded his stock and moved to a larger premises, stocking medicines, cleaning products, general groceries, as well as imported spices and sauces. By 1823, with the aid of several shrewd investments in property, business and farmland, he was able to afford the passage for his wife and children to join him in Sydney, and for both of his sons to attend grammar school. With one eye on a full pardon, Tao wasn't shy in handing his newfound wealth over to support the foundations of schools, churches and other good causes, and generally he did his best to become one of the elite free settlers that he had watched employ convicts since his arrival. Despite this, however, his absolute pardon continued to elude him, and his application was rejected a further two times before the expiry of his sentence in 1828. One year after he had earned his freedom, he sailed back to England with a net worth of well over £10,000. When he arrived in England, John Towle settled his family in Whitechapel, London, and in a sure sign of his elevated status after returning from Australia, he sent his eldest son on a medical apprenticeship with the aim of him becoming a doctor. With his crimes now paid for, John sought to rejoin the Quakers' meetings too, confident in the knowledge that all of his philanthropic work would have seen his sins scrubbed as clean as his criminal past. With a second move to one of the newly created leafy London suburbs, life seemed to be going well for the one-time convict. Unfortunately, his family's health was less stellar, and both his sons and wife had fallen ill with consumption, cutting the triumphant return home abruptly short. Tower made plans to return to Australia in the hopes that the warmer climate would aid in their recovery, but before they could make their passage, his youngest son, William Henry, died aged just 21 years old. By 1834, Tower was back in Sydney again, where, still having much of the property and business investments from his time in Australia before, his life quickly fell back into step. This time, he was able to continue his religious goals, though, and he took it upon himself to befriend a small party of missionaries and even began hosting worship meetings at his house, essentially founding the first ever Quaker congregation in Sydney. As the numbers grew, so too did the need for a proper meeting house. And so, Tao had one built, establishing it as a school for girls during the weekdays. Eventually, with his wife's consumption not improving though, Tao grew tired of Australia, and so he wound up his business affairs, sold off the majority of his assets, and in 1838 he moved back to England once more, this time for good. Shortly after his arrival back on English shores, he employed a young nurse named Sarah Hadler to look after his wife, recommended to him by a mutual friend named Sarah Bacon. Mrs Hadler was diligent, patient and kind, which were great qualities for a nurse, but sadly they didn't work the miracles that would have been needed to save John's wife and her body finally gave in to her illness that winter of December 1838. After his wife's death, John threw himself into his philanthropic duties, and at the same time angled for a full official return to the Quakers. In a clearly calculated manoeuvre, he pledged to hand over ownership of his meeting house property to the Sydney congregation, and then, just days later, applied for reinstatement to the Quakers back in Devonshire House. His wish to be reinstated was more than just a matter of pride, however. Though that undoubtedly did play a significant part, but the matter had grown much more desperate after he had met and made plans to marry Sarah Cutforth, a Quaker who had been born into the religion and whose marriage to John would have seen her officially removed if they were to marry before his reinstatement. This difficult situation had already seen Sarah call off their marriage once already, and John was keen to settle the matter, both for the sake of his own bruised ego and for his future marriage. It would have been a harsh pill to swallow then, that after all of his good deeds and generous offerings, he was rejected by Devonshire House categorically. Eventually, he and Sarah married regardless, in February of 1841, which, as expected, saw Sarah also officially removed from her position as a Quaker. This did not stop the family dressing and acting as good Quakers, and they continued to attend meetings in Berkhamsted, where John and Sarah had settled in a large three-storey red brick house, fronted with large porch and Venetian window. It was a lavish property, by far the most grandiose in the parish, and was perfectly fit for a man of John's wealth, which was, by now, well in excess of £20,000. Though much of this was tied up in land, property and business investments, much of which was on the other side of the world. Unfortunately for John, the other side of the world 
was not having a particularly good time, economically speaking. John was able to send his stepdaughters to school, and he continued to give money and medicine to several charities, as well as indulging a large natural history collection. Socially speaking, he continued to be involved in the parish political affairs, and when he felt it best positioned, he once again applied for reinstatement to the Quakers, but that was once more rejected. It was something of an uneasy time for John, whose life seemed to be on a continuous roller coaster, tame as it may have been for the most part. One particular high was the birth of his son, Henry Augustus, with his new wife Sarah in August of 1843. On the flip side of this, despite John travelling into London regularly to uphold social and business affairs, money continued to tighten as the Sydney economy shrunk by the day. So much so that John was actually forced to reconsider his domestic expenditure. And so life continued this way for John Towell, who, despite it all, lived a fairly quiet existence, taking care of his business life and attending Quaker meetings with his wife Sarah. At least, until a string of events on New Year's Day of 1845, when everything would be turned upside down. In 1845, Slough was a blossoming suburb, sitting 20 miles west of London, on the main stagecoach line between the capital city and Bath. Until the early 1840s, it had been a relatively small hamlet, with a population of around 2,000 and little of note, outside a handful of inns and taverns, catering to the travellers who stopped over as they shuttled east to west across the country. In 1838, the opening of the Great Western Railway Line that took people all the way from London to Bristol heralded the beginning of Slough's growth, when a station was installed along the route two years later, replacing the stagecoach traffic. Before long, the hamlet had transformed from a sleepy village into a market town and Bath Place in Salt Hill, sitting east of the High Street, opposite large open green fields and trees, was the epitome of the quiet, leafy suburb town that it was quickly becoming. Mary Ann Ashley sat in her lounge in her home on Bath Place on the evening of New Year's Day 1845, with a difficult decision to make. She'd been minding her own business at around 6.30pm when she heard the muffled sound of loud voices coming through the walls from the house next door. The young lady who had lived there, Sarah Hart, was living home alone with her two children as her husband worked abroad, and the two had been good friends since she'd moved in five years earlier, and Mary had always liked to keep an eye on her. When she heard a scream, she knew that she couldn't just sit there idle. Standing up, resigned, she stepped out into the street and made her way over to the gate next door. As she approached it, a man stepped out from Mary's front door, wearing full Quaker garb, who Mary recognised as Mr Talbot, Sarah's father-in-law. He had arrived an hour or so earlier that evening to give her an allowance that her husband had sent to her from overseas, as he always had. She called out to him as he approached the gate and fumbled with the lock, asking him what was wrong with Sarah. Keeping his head down, looking confused and trembling very much, he eventually got the gate open and paced off quickly down the street, ignoring Mary entirely. Concerned, Mary stepped through the gate and walked down the path, catching the front door that had been left open, swinging on its hinges. Inside the house was dim, but even in the gloom, Mary could make out Sarah, lying on her back on the floor, her head towards the door, groaning weakly. Her hat had been cast aside and one shoe had fallen off, and her skirts were ruffled up by her knees. Whatever had been going on, it was clear to Mary that Sarah would need help quickly. She stepped backwards out of the house and back into the garden, before turning and running to the neighbours to call for help and send for a doctor. Unfortunately, Dr Henry Montague Champness arrived at around 6.55pm, just in time to hear Sarah scratch out her last breath. Looking around the room, he saw a small occasional table with a pair of tumblers and a beer bottle by the fire, along with a small plate with the remainder of what appeared to be a half-eaten plum cake. All told, though, the room looked in reasonably good order, overlooking the dead body lying in the middle of it, of course. Initial inspections of Sarah didn't seem to show any signs of physical violence, and there was no blood on the floor beneath her. Nevertheless, she was certainly dead, so he sent a message to his cousin, the Reverend Edward Thomas Champness, and then stepped out into the road, climbed aboard his pony and trap, and set off in the direction of the high street, hoping to catch up with the Quaker. Catching no sight of him, he headed back to Salt Hill in order to rendezvous with the Reverend so that he could collect him and the pair could head off to the train station, where they hoped he could check the platform before the 742 train to London departed. 
They left Mary and the neighbours at the house to keep watch over Sarah's body and search around for any small vials that they could have carried poison, which the doctor was fairly sure at this early juncture would have been used to have killed Sarah. Arriving at Slough Station just after 7.42, the doctor and the reverend explained the situation to the station superintendent, Henry Howell. Howell mentioned that he had seen a man wearing Quaker clothing at the station not long ago. He had even stopped him and asked him the way to the trains, but he had already left aboard a first-class cabin on the train to London. Fortunately, Slough Station was one of the very few train stations in 1845 that had been equipped with a working electrical telegraph, and so Howe directed the two men to follow him to the office where it was kept. Invented in 1837, the Cook and Wheatstone Telegraph was the first example of an electrical telegraph to have ever been used in a commercial setting. A text messaging system, the telegraph was capable of moving magnetic needles on a receiving unit in order to point to specific letters and spell out words and sentences that were input from a sending unit. The movements were facilitated by an electrical current that coursed through the wires that connected the two units, sometimes over many dozens of miles. With 20 letters on a diamond-shaped grid and five needles separating the top and bottom half, messages were typed in at one end that would move two needles at the other, indicating the correct letter at the intersecting point. Amusingly, Despite the fact that the monarchy was headed up by Queen Victoria, the machine's limitations meant that six letters were omitted, and the inventors, Charles Wheatstone and William Fothergill Cook, chose C, J, Q, U, X and Z for the chop. The machine's first long-distance test had taken place in the summer of 1837 and had sent a message one and a half miles across London, between a carriage shed in Euston Street Station to Camden Town. Immediately convinced that the machine had huge commercial use at train stations up and down the country, the years after it had been something of a letdown for the inventors as people found the design confusing and the installation of a lengthy system costly. A breakthrough was made when the Great Western Railway installed telegraph offices connecting Paddington Station and West Drayton, but the huge lengths of cabling proved to be expensive to maintain and further adoption had been slow, with the line extending to Slough in 1842 but not stretching any further. By 1845, the telegraph office in Paddington Station was being run by Thomas Home, who had licensed the system out at the princely sum of £176 per year, with his brother, Richard, manning the office in Slough. Until now, he had been operating it as something of a tourist attraction, where visitors could come and wonder at the curious little machine for a single shilling. It was a million miles away from the groundbreaking invention that some thought it could be, improving safety and efficiency of the railway networks up and down the land. When Henry Howe burst into the telegraph office on New Year's Day, followed by the doctor and the reverend, Richard Holm knew it was his time to shine. Firing up the machine, he rang the alarm, signalling to Paddington that an incoming message was on its way and began to type out a message, one letter at a time. A murder has just been committed at Salt Hill, and the suspected murderer was seen to take a first-class ticket for London by the train which left Slough at 7.42pm. He is in the garb of a Quaker with a brown greatcoat on which reaches nearly down to his feet. He is in the last compartment of the second-class carriage. The message was fairly confusing at first. With no letter Q to speak of, Richard had spelt Quaker phonetically, K-W-A-K-E-R, and it took a short back and forth before everything became clear. The 742 train to London was due at Paddington at 8.20, so Thomas took the message to the station's deputy superintendent, De May, who immediately sent him to collect Sergeant William Williams of the Great Western Railway Police. Being the least conspicuous of the party, Thomas Home was sent onto the platform to keep an eye out for the arriving Quaker, whilst the two officials stalked back at the far end of the station, where they could overlook the impending arrival. At 8.20 on the dot, the train from Slough pulled into Paddington Station and eased to a stop on the crowded platform. Thomas jostled his way through the people toing and throwing from the wooden and iron carriages, looking for the suspect Quaker, who, just as expected, stepped out from the first-class carriages and began making his way through the station. Home followed him at a distance, signalling to Demay and Williams, who had also spied the man, and the three trailed him out into the street, just in time to see him board an omnibus bound for New Road. 
Mr. May and home headed back into the station in order to send a message back to Slough via the telegraph explaining the Quaker's arrival, whilst Williams hopped aboard the omnibus in pursuit. For 45 minutes, Williams watched out for the Quaker to alight, which he eventually did, passing directly in front of the inspector, who made sure he got a close look at the man's face. He was a fairly looking man, he thought. Williams found it hard to believe that he was a murderer. His Quaker outfit inspired confidence in his character in itself, but he also thought that the man's face didn't appear to show any signs of malice. Aging and simple, somewhere between 50 and 60 years old, outside of a pronounced lazy eye, the man looked entirely forgettable. Stepping off the omnibus, Williams continued to follow the man at a distance, watching as he stopped at the Jerusalem coffee house and knocked on the door. The coffee house was clearly closed, but someone opened the door and the Quaker chatted to whoever it was for a few moments before he exchanged an umbrella for a parcel and coat and then set back out into the street, marching off towards London Bridge. Williams followed again, wheezing through the busy evening streets and saw the man stop once more at the Leopard Coffee House. The bright lights that filtered from outside into the dim street signalled that this time the place was open and so Williams settled in for a prolonged wait. Fortunately, it was only about 20 minutes before the Quaker was back out into the streets again, this time walking back in the direction that they had come. The man was walking at a brisk pace, only stopping briefly for a moment under a street light to pull out a piece of paper from his pocket, read it, place it back and once more continue on ahead, only stopping again once he arrived outside an accommodation house at Seven Scots Yard. Williams sat outside, waiting for 45 minutes before deciding that the man had likely bedded down for the night. With a sigh of resignation, he set off back to Paddington to report everything that he had seen. Meanwhile, back in Slough, Dr Champ Ness had returned to Bath Place, arriving around 9pm and begun his search of the crime scene. He inspected Sarah once more by the dim candlelight, but he still couldn't see any immediate physical problems. He collected up the two glass tumblers, along with the brown beer bottle, and the remains of the plum cake that had been sitting on the occasional table. At the same time, the parish constable, William Hill, arrived and took a statement from Mary Ann Ashley about all that she had seen and the noises coming through the wall that had led her to discover Sarah on the floor of the house. A full search was carried out, and several small empty vials were found, but none that were suspected of being recently filled with poison. The night's events were closed with the police sending a message to Williams back in Paddington to arrest the Quaker first thing in the morning. The following morning, Williams went to Paddington Police Station to collect Inspector William Wiggins, and the two set off back to the accommodation house in Scots Yard, being sure to cover their uniforms with their coats in order to seem less obvious in their approach. Their problems were immediately apparent, however, once they knocked on the door and the man opening it was himself dressed in full Quaker clothing, though he was not the man that they were there to arrest. As it turned out, the house was a boarding house, especially for Quakers, making the police's main search criteria almost entirely redundant. They asked after a Mr Talbot, but were told that there had not been a man by that name staying at the house. So instead, they asked if they had seen a man with a lazy eye. All became clear to the doorman, who explained that the man with the lazy eye had been staying there. He was a respectable gent, going by the name of Mr John Towle. Unfortunately for the policeman, nobody was sure where Tao had gone after he had left the lodging house that morning, leaving Williams and Wiggins at a loss as to where to turn next. With no other leads, they traced Williams' steps from the night before and paid a visit to the coffee houses that they had seen Tao visit. It turned out to be an inspired choice, as the staff at Jerusalem Coffee House said they had seen him that morning, but unfortunately they had just missed him, as he had left not long before their arrival. Back out on the streets, the two policemen walked around hoping to spy the Quaker amongst the hustle and bustle, but after an hour and no sightings, they gave up and decided to head back to the coffee house once more. This time, however, Tao was there. Backpedalling into the street, Williams stayed outside, prone to pounce just in case Tao attempted to flee, whilst Wiggins stepped back inside to make the arrest. He approached the Quaker, greeted him, and confirmed that his name was John Tao before explaining that he was under arrest for the murder of Sarah Hart. Alarmed, Tao explained that he had spent all day yesterday at home in Burke Hampstead and no idea who Sarah Hart was. Nevertheless, he agreed to go with Wiggins into custody 
and the two men joined Williams outside and then jumped aboard a train and headed for Slough in order to join the inquest. Back in Slough, Dr Champness was joined by Dr Edward Weston Nordblad and the two men returned to Sarah's house in order to inspect the body. The cold light of day illuminated the living room much better, but it didn't really shine a light on any obvious cause of death. In the sunlight, the doctors were still unable to see any physical signs of violence, no bruises, no broken bones and no blood. Her nose, eyes, ears and mouth all seemed normal, as did her stomach. Norblad agreed with Champness's initial reaction to the body that the death was likely from some kind of poison, and the doctors reported their conclusion to the coroner, who was busy arranging an inquest at the Three Turns Tavern just down the road from Sarah's house. A jury had been assembled and taken to inspect the body, afterwards allowing the doctors to continue with a full post-mortem inspection, which they did once they were joined by Dr William Bolton Pickering from London. The internal inspection fared little better than any external inspection, and Sarah's brain, stomach, heart and lungs all appeared healthy, aside from a lesion on one of her lungs, though all three men agreed that it would not have played any role in her death. The stomach contents were bottled up and removed in order for them to undergo a full chemical inspection by a chemist in London, whilst the results were reported to the inquest, where John Tao had arrived and been locked in the back room. Upon his arrival, he had been searched where they found twelve pounds and ten shillings in gold, one pound, one shilling and sixpence in silver, two and a half pence in copper, a gold watch, two pairs of spectacles, a pocketbook and pencil, a penknife, some silk handkerchiefs, a collection of blank cheques, and a letter from his wife describing her day in Berkhampstead, whilst John had been away in London, somewhat undermining Tower's defence that he'd been at home all day the day before. Before the inquest began, one of Sarah's neighbours was brought in to identify Tao as the man who had visited Sarah the day before, which she did with 100% certainty. Despite the mysterious events surrounding both Sarah's death and the undetermined cause of death, the inquest was a rather straightforward affair. Mary Ann Ashley and several other neighbours told the inquest that, as far as they knew, Sarah's father-in-law routinely came by ever since she would moved into the area, and would drop off £13 every six weeks or so for her allowance, sent to her from her husband. Mary had thought it a little strange that her father-in-law had a different surname to Sarah, and that she had never worn a wedding ring, but she hadn't ever really given it too much thought. The rumours were that her father-in-law had never approved of his son's marriage to Sarah, but their relationship seemed at least cordial, as he had often bought her gifts and even helped her to furnish her house after she had arrived in Slough. No one ever thought that anything improper had been going on with the relationship, despite the fact that Sarah had told some of her friends that she'd moved to Slough from London in the first place in order for matters of privacy. Raising her two children alone on the £13 allowance had always been difficult, and most had heard that she had been behind on rent and long since struggling for money. The doctors were called to give their findings, explaining they would need to send the stomach for further tests, and that, as it stood, they could not be certain of any cause of death. The coroner, left with no other choice, adjourned the inquest and, refusing bail, ordered Tao to be taken into custody until its resolution. Unwilling to lock up the unassuming religious man more than he needed to, Superintendent Perkins took him back to his house in Eton to keep him chained and under watch until the resumption of proceedings. After the first stage of the inquest, news quickly began to spread of what everyone was assuming was a poisoning especially after the first press reports openly alluded to as much. The locals around Salt Hill organised their own search of the area, but all was found was a single, empty, discarded medicine vial which was handed over to police, but not thought to have been important to the investigation. Meanwhile, Dr Champness and Norblad paid a visit to the consultant chemist John Thomas Cooper in London with the contents of Sarah's stomach, along with the artefacts taken from the occasional table. Over the course of a single afternoon, Everything was tested in the lab in order to detect for all the most popular poisons of the day, including arsenic, antimony and opium, but nothing showed any positive results. As a last-ditch effort, Cooper tested for prussic acid, despite the fact that neither doctor had reported smelling it on Sarah's body shortly after her death, nor in her stomach during the post-mortem examination. The three doctors watched on as, much to their surprise, the contents of the test tube turned a deep, characteristic blue of hydrogen cyanide. The following Saturday, the 4th of January, the inquest resumed in the Three Turns Tavern in Slough. 
The doctors returned to give their conclusions of the tests that they had undertaken in London with John Thomas Cooper, and whilst they admitted that they were still not 100% sure that prussic acid had been the cause of death, they told the coroner that they had every reason to believe so. It was not the strongest testimony ever, and it continued to falter after they went on to admit that they had no practical experience with prussic acid poisoning. They also had no idea how much of the poison would have had to have been used to have killed her, nor could they explain why they were unable to smell the poison in Sarah's mouth or stomach, given that it was usually documented to have had a pungent smell of bitter almonds. Dr Norblad was firm in his convictions, however, and he told the inquest that he was certain that prussic acid had been administered to Sarah, causing her death. After the barmaid from the nearby Botham Hotel testified that she had sold Sarah the beer on Friday evening, where she had said she had seen her looking quite well, the inquest was adjourned once more, once the coroner learned that neither the beer bottle nor the glass tumblers had yet been tested, and once more, John Towell was taken back to Perkins House in Eton. In the days between the inquest, the newspapers began their own investigations, and many began to print rumour and speculation in order to fill their columns. Soon, the word on the street was that Sarah and John Tao had been having some kind of romantic relationship, and that illegitimate children were mixed up in the event somehow. The official investigation, however, was continuing in, in a much more solid direction and beat police across London and Slough had been instructed to visit every druggist across London to inquire if anyone had sold prussic acid to a man matching Tao's description. Leaflets were printed out that included the same description and left in every apothecary whose staff was not on hand to speak with the police upon their first visit. It was a tactic that had some exciting success for the police when, soon enough, a chemist named Henry Thomas, working in a pharmacy on Bishopsgate Street in East London, admitted to having served Tao very recently. He had, in fact, served Tao on several occasions, and he knew that he had a history as a pharmacist in Australia himself. On New Year's Day, he had sold Tao two drachms of Shields prussic acid and another two drachms more on the following day. Tao had told the chemist that he had a prescription to use the poison to rub on his legs, and returned the second day, saying that he had dropped and smashed the first vial, and so needed a replacement. Whilst police trudged across London, the doctors convened in Cooper's lab once more and tests were carried out on the plum cake, both tumblers, the beer bottle and an amount of beer that had been removed from one of the glasses. However, no trace of any poisoning whatsoever was found. As troubling as this result was, the doctors still remained positive in the tests taken on the stomach and so when they presented the new evidence to the inquest after its reconvening the following Wednesday, they remained adamant that Sarah's death had been caused by prussic acid just seemed they had no idea precisely how it had gotten into her system. By the time of the inquest's final hearing, on Wednesday the 8th of January, the crowds had grown considerably thanks to the press reports on the alleged murderer. The audience were treated to another long day of confusing medical evidence where the doctors confirmed that they had little knowledge of prussic acid, no evidence of having found any in any of the items taken from the crime scene, but nevertheless were pretty sure that there was evidence of the poison in the victim's stomach. Dramatics did follow somewhat after the testimonies were interrupted in order for the news that a man matching Tao's description had been reported as having bought prussic acid from the Bishopsgate Pharmacy, the news of which had only reached Slough that morning. At the end of the day, the jury stepped out for a total of 45 minutes before returning a verdict of willful murder against John Tao for poisoning Sarah Hart with prussic acid. His trial was scheduled to take place as part of the spring assizes, and until then, he was ordered to be placed in Aylesbury Jail. Tao, who had up until now sat and watched proceedings with a calm air, stumbled for the first time as he left the inquest, escorted by police on either arm. Following the inquest, there was a flurry of activity on the case, both on the official side and in the newspapers and public. Tao's home in Burke Hampstead was searched by the police, who found a collection of used and empty medicine vials, some with labels from the pharmacy in Bishopsgate, but none that tested positive for poisons. At the same time, the chemist owner, Henry Thomas, was taken to Tao's cell, where he gave him a positive ID as the man who had bought prussic acid on the 1st and 2nd of January. Whilst the bottles were being tested, Inspector Wiggins took it upon himself to investigate Tao's financial situation, and he visited the bank where he had discovered that Tao's problems were far more advanced than he had been letting on, having withdrawn his account on New Year's Day. Meanwhile, the newspapers focused on Sarah's funeral, 
which saw her buried in St Mary's Parish Church on the 9th of January, attended by a great number of persons who followed the processions three miles through the streets. On the same day, police were busy investigating a pair of leads that they had gained from concerned newspaper readers who had written letters to the editors concerning Sarah Hart's identity. Inspector Wiggins travelled to Clerkenwell to visit a Mrs Bacon who had been a friend of the Towers back in London and who had introduced John to Sarah Hadler, the nurse that took care of his first wife while she was slowly dying from consumption. She suggested that Sarah Hart was one and the same, Towles' ex-nurse, who he had had a two-year relationship with, overlapping both of his marriages, and who he had had an illicit child with in 1840. Mrs Bacon went on to say that Tao had been paying her off ever since, in order to keep her quiet and out of the way, so that she would not complicate his second marriage to Sarah Cutforth. Sarah Hart's parents were promptly contacted and taken to identify the body on the evening of the funeral where they confirmed that the dead woman was their daughter, Sarah Hart, the Towles' ex-nurse, a fact that had clear implications for John Towles' upcoming trial in March. Despite the clear change in narrative in the newspapers, reflecting the public outrage at John Towle, the guilty womaniser, as opposed to John Towle, the generous philanthropist, the Towles themselves continued life as happily as they could, given the circumstances. John was convinced of his innocence and acted relaxed in prison, whilst his wife visited him regularly and set about planning a party for his eventual release. John secured the services of Fitzroy Kelly for his defence, a renowned and very expensive lawyer with a flair for dramatics and a reputation for mounting strong pleas. The police, on the other hand, concerned themselves with trying to experiment on the remains of the victim's stomach contents in order to try and prove how much prussic acid had been used in her murder. However, with toxicology still very much in its infancy, progress was troubled at best. Dr Norblad busied himself by carrying out an experiment on a pair of dogs where he fed them both poisoned beer with differing amounts of prussic acid mixed in in order to see if their bodies would leave a discernible odour or if it might dissipate over time as they were hypothesising had happened with Sarah, the results of which were far from conclusive. Finally, the Springer Sizes rolled into town on the 10th of March, signalling the start of the season's most hotly anticipated trial two days later. Events started early, with police drafted in at 8.30am, tasked with lining the stairs leading to the courtroom in order to create enough space outside in the gathering throng for the attendees to fight through to the front door so that the trial could get underway the scenes being the most animated and eminently disorderly that could possibly be imagined. Once everyone was settled and seated in the courtroom, the clerk announced the beginning of proceedings by reading out the charge to the court. John Tell, not having the fear of God before his eyes and being instigated by the devil, did wickedly and with malice afterthought on the 1st of January at Salt Hill make an assault upon one Sarah Hart and cause her to take two drachms weight of prussic acid, well knowing the same to be a deadly poison, and he did force the said Sarah Hart to take into her body the said poison, by the operation of which poison she fell mortally sick, and did then and there die. In response, John Tow, dressed in full Quaker outfit, made his plea of not guilty, and the trial was underway with all the dramatics that were said to be of the opening of a minor London theatre for the first night of the Christmas pantomime. The prosecution opened the case with lead prosecutor Sergeant Biles preparing the jury for what was to come by telling them that they should probably not expect more than circumstantial evidence to be presented. He then went on to explain the long relationship between John Tow and Sarah Hart, of how she had come to be in his domestic service and of how she had bore two of his children and then been pushed aside and kept quiet with a feeble financial allowance. Mary Ann Ashley was then called to the stand to give her testimony where she walked the court through the events that had led her to discovering Sarah as she lay dying on her living room floor, and of how, with the aid of the landlady that she had called on for help, the women had tried to pour a glass of water into Sarah's mouth to get her to drink, all to no avail. She had initially been alerted to the cries from her neighbours, as she had never found Sarah Hart to have been a passionate or hysterical woman, she said. Following the early, fairly harrowing round of examination and cross-examination, a long list of witnesses who had seen John Tow travel from London to Slough on New Year's Day were called, including a ticket seller at the train station who had sold Tow a ticket to Slough, and a waiter at the Jerusalem Coffee House who had seen him earlier in the day and then late that night when he had knocked on the door whilst being tailed by Williams. <laughs>
in the afternoon, just as things were growing slow and weary, Inspector Samuel Perkins, who had taken Towel into custody in his home in Eton, took the stand and dropped an unexpected piece of new information that was guaranteed to wake up any of the sleepers at the back of the courtroom. Whilst he had been having lunch with Tao at his home after the inquest had been adjourned for the first time, Tao had opened up to the inspector with a story about his relationship with Sarah, which officially, at this time, he had still been denying. He said that he'd been in the habit of allowing her money, and that she used to pester him writing letters to him asking for more money, that she had been a very good servant, but a very bad principled woman, that she had written to him that if he did not send her some, she would do something. She would make away with herself. He said he then came down to her house and told her he would not allow her any more money. She then asked him if he would give her a drop of porter. He said he sent her for a bottle of stout and he had a glass and she had a glass. Then she held her hand over a glass and said, I will, I will. She poured something into the glass out of a small phial, not much bigger than a thimble. Then she drank a part and the remainder was thrown into the fire. She then began to throw herself about as if in convulsions, and then lay down upon the hearth rug. He then went out. He did not believe that she was in earnest, or he would have called some person. This was quite the revelation. The police had found a small scrap of burnt paper or leather in the fire, which they did for a while assume came from the stopper of a medicine vial, but no other trace was found, and the line of inquiry had been dropped. Following the inspector's somewhat shocking testimony, Things quickly fell back into step, and more witnesses continued to give their evidence building the case for the prosecution. The much-hyped Fitzroy Kelly did so little during cross-examinations that some newspaper writers questioned precisely what Tower was paying him for. The rest of the afternoon was filled with three doctors giving their medical evidence, much of it altogether confusing and at times verging into the realms of the hypothetical. Not a single one of them seemed to have the toxicology experience to be sure exactly how much prussic acid it would have taken to kill Sarah, until finally, with the lights dim under candlelight, the court was adjourned after an exhausting first day. The second day of the trial opened, with more exhaustive toxicology evidence being presented, as the chemist, John Thomas Cooper, took the stand to explain in minute detail all of the tests that he had performed in order to test for the various substances and items for various poisons. One rather amusing point of contention came when he explained that he had at some point been concerned about the finding that Sarah had eaten an amount of apple just before her death, and he was unsure if the pips of the apple could have potentially produced enough prussic acid to have caused her death. The chemist experimented himself and found out that although pips did produce the poison, it was in such small quantities as to be inconsequential. This didn't stop the defence hopping aboard the obvious lack of experience and knowledge, however, when they somewhat desperately questioned if Sarah's death could possibly have been caused by her eating a large amount of fruit over the festive season. Dr Nordblad, as always, was far more confident in his statements when he took the stand, where he explained the results of his experiments, poisoning dogs to the courtroom. Under cross-examination, all three doctors were forced to admit that Tao's purchase of the poison was not entirely abnormal, after they were presented with a prescription for prussic acid that John Tao had used for a long-standing condition of varicose veins, a treatment that all three doctors agreed was perfectly appropriate. When he called Henry Thomas to the stand, the chemist who had sold Tao the prussic acid in the first place, he too admitted that the prescription was entirely normal, and then further went on to say that he did not think the smell of prussic acid could even be disguised in a glass of beer. His experience, he explained, had come from when he had used it to kill a customer's sickly pet parrot. After the lengthy medical evidence was over, a friend of Sarah's, Charlotte Howard, added another troublesome testimony for Tao when she told the court that Sarah had fallen sick on the 30th of September, the night of Tao's previous visit. Tao had excused himself after sharing a bottle of beer with Sarah and handing over her allowance. He left her to go to bed early as she said that she had felt sick. She then proceeded to stay awake all night vomiting. In Tao's favour, she did say that she drank some of the leftover beer herself and had not been ill. And with that, the prosecution handed over to the defence. Finally, after a day and a half of the prosecution building their case against Tao, it was the turn of Fitzroy Kelly to earn his hefty fee. In his usual manner, the dramatic lawyer opened with a long, verbose speech, questioning the strength of the evidence against Tao, and though he admitted that John having children with Sarah had no doubt been immoral, it had not been illegal, 
And besides, he reminded the court, had he not supported them financially? Looking to boost the perception of Tao's character, he then went on to explain that his old crimes, for which he'd already been atoned for, were nothing at all like murder. In order to back up this speech, he went on to call a slew of character witnesses, who all confirmed that John was nothing if not a fantastic gentleman. He also worked to show that far from bankrupt, John's financial difficulties were only temporary, which he proved by showing that he was in receipt of £700 from Australia shortly after Sarah's death. Tao, he argued, was hardly a desperate man. Perhaps, he ruminated, it was the neighbours who had killed Sarah when they had poured water into her mouth after discovering her lying on the floor. If all of this felt a little bit like a leap to some in the audience, the suggestion that Tao was rapid fleeing from the victim's home was possibly due to the fact that the evening was rather chilly and he was moving quickly in order to keep himself warm would have sounded absolutely ridiculous. With his dramatics over, the court adjourned for the final time after another long day, with the summary saved until the morning of the third day. The next day, at 11.35am, the jury was sent out to make their deliberations, which lasted only 30 minutes before they returned to the judge to hand over a verdict of guilty. Prisoner at the bar, the jury have just pronounced their unanimous and deliberate verdict against you. It now remains for me to perform my duty by telling you that for that horrible, base and cowardly crime of which you have been convicted upon clear and satisfactory evidence, you must die an ignominious and horrid death on the common scaffold. The judge's final words, may the Lord have mercy upon your miserable soul, rang around the courtroom as John Tao stepped back below the dock safe in the knowledge that his freedom party was almost definitely cancelled. As it turned out in the days following the trial, the feeling in much of the judge's final words were not exactly echoed by everyone. For a start, the verdict had been far from unanimous. In fact, six of the jury had been sure of Tao's innocence right up until the morning of his sentencing, and they admitted to the press after the fact that had they been forced to go out and deliberate at the end of the second day rather than the morning of the third, they would have argued as such. A petition was organised and sent to the Queen, asking her for a mercy call in order to save Tao from the gallows, signed by the foreman of the jury, amongst others. Questions were raised against the medical and toxicology evidence and why the defence had not called in experts to refute the doctors, who didn't seem to have much practical knowledge of prussic acid to speak of. There were further inconsistencies too. The doctors, who had all originally testified that they had not been able to smell prussic acid on Sarah's breath nor in her stomach contents, had suddenly changed their mind, now stating that they had. One of the most damning pieces of evidence to emerge after the trial was the fact that Sarah had in fact threatened suicide on several occasions before due to her financial struggles. It wasn't all just riffraff that supported Towel either. Prominent members of society, like the Lord Nugent, backed the Quaker questioning publicly why, if Tao had killed Sarah, would he have bothered to have overdraw his account in order to pay her that evening, and why would he have purchased the poison from a chemist that knew him on quite good terms and that had been serving him for some time? Why also had he visited Sarah wearing his distinctive Quaker garb if he had wanted to remain inconspicuous? They were all questions echoed in letters to the newspapers for several weeks after the guilty verdict was passed, but eventually it was all to no avail. Tao's execution was scheduled for Friday the 28th of March, when he was to be publicly hanged in the grounds of the Aylesby prison. Running up to the execution, Tao remained calm and adamant of his innocence. It wasn't until the night before the hanging that John wrote a confession and handed it over to the chaplain, asking him to keep the exact details secret, though he agreed to allow the general details to be made public after his death. The morning of his execution was a grey and dreary affair following a night of strong storms, though the poor weather didn't stop the crowds from turning out in their masses, with some estimates putting the number at around 5,000 people from all across the country. The atmosphere was one of festival joviality as people got roundly drunk and brawled in the streets. The London Waxwork Museum, Madame Tussauds, had made a bid of £25 to the executioner, hoping to buy Tao's clothes, though it seems Tao's wife had managed to secure them for herself. After spending the night praying, John Tao walked out towards the gibbet shortly before 8am. He walked with a firm step to the drop, attended by the Reverend F. Cox, the under-sheriff, the governor and a jailer. He was brought out on the scaffold at a quarter before eight 
when he was hurried into eternity in a matter that reflects the highest disgrace on all parties concerned in the matter. His struggles were most protracted and fearful. Tao's executioner had failed to adjust the rope to the correct length, leaving him to swing by his neck for several minutes whilst he was strangled to death. When he had finally stopped moving, his body was left to hang for an hour before being pulled down and buried in the jail's grounds. With his execution complete, loose details of Tao's confession were released. In what was said to be a short piece, he stated that he had been guilty of murdering Sarah, that he had placed the prussic acid in her beer, and that he had also attempted to kill her during his visit on the 30th of September, though on that occasion he had used morphia, which had only led to her to fall sick. He had murdered her, he said, in order to keep his wife from finding out the truth, that he had had two children with his former nurse. It was, on the whole, an unsatisfactory conclusion to the saga, with the chaplain refusing to hand over the original copy of the confession to the press in accordance with Tao's final wishes. Many suggested a conspiracy and accused it of being entirely fictional in nature. In fact, no copies of the confession have ever been found. So was Tao really guilty of the murder, or was it a suicide as he had originally told the inspector over lunch? The evidence against him was almost entirely circumstantial, with all modern investigation entirely impossible. But at the same time, Tao's defence appeared desperate at best. Whatever way events turned out, it's true that John Tao was a man who spent his life hiding behind a mask of respectability, whilst concealing a secret that proved him far less wholesome. Following the case, which saw prussic acid used as a weapon of murder in Britain for the first time, the electrical telegraph, which had featured so prominently, saw a new lease of life, as railways across the country saw the benefit of the machine. Within four years of Tao's execution, the telegraph network extended to over 200 offices up and down the country, making it the first commercial use of electricity in the world, heralding a new era of near-instant communication utilised in travel, crime-fighting and news reporting that would go on to transform the world, firmly paving the way for the start of the technological revolution. So there we go. That was the story of John Tao and the murder of Sarah Hart or the suicide of Sarah Hart, depending on which one you believe. And we'll talk a little bit about that after these short advert breaks. Today's episode is sponsored by Babbel. For most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point in our academic careers. And I can guarantee that it was probably the lowest point of my secondary school education was my French and German lessons, which were essentially an excuse to harass the teacher because we were awful teenagers. Anyway, now thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be travelling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or you just have some free time, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. I have been using Babbel and I, I, I signed up for the French lessons because, like I say, I did French in secondary school. It was such a long time ago, I thought... You know, it'd be kind of fun to brush up. One of the reasons I, I, I quite enjoy doing it is because I, I already speak a second language, but I th- and a, and a third language is, for my tiny brain, like quite quite difficult. But Babel has like short, like they set up 15-minute lessons uh, and, and they do make it a, a quick and easy way to learn without kind of putting too much into it, if you like. And, and, and you find, you, you just pick it up naturally if you're just doing like small, short lessons daily. Uh, it... it, it becomes less of learning and and more about just sort of habitually doing and it and it, it just happens uh which is quite nice uh there's a whole bunch of languages to choose from including spanish french italian and german and the uh, lessons are crafted specifically to be about uh, real life so you learn actual practical conversations about travel relationships business and things like that and that I think is kind of key with language learning because so often you have textbooks and you just learn useless phrases that you're not going to use. So yeah, you get lessons, podcasts, games, videos, stories, even live classes. And if you don't really find you get on with it, it comes with a 20 day money back guarantee. So that's kind of a nice thing. So if you feel like starting a new language learning journey, why not do it today with Babbel? Right now you can get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash dark histories. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash dark histories. 
for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Welcome back. So, interesting story this one, I thought. Quite an interesting, I like the way it's sort of a tale of two halves and, you know, you have Tao's kind of life in Australia and then Tao's life in, in, in London as a, as, a, as a murder suspect, essentially. And so I, I personally think this case sort of hinges on one aspect and that's how arrogant was John Tao. And I think the answer is probably quite a lot because I think if it wasn't to his arrogance, then he wouldn't have just assumed that he could just get away with this. And I think that's the reason... He dressed in a Quaker outfit to go and kill her, basically, because all of those things sort of do go against it. And actually, I think it's quite a strong argument that she potentially committed suicide. Although, obviously, even then, you would still say he's not entirely innocent. You know, maybe not. Maybe he didn't kill her, but he certainly helped drive her to, you know, the situation that she was in. But anyway, if if you investigate, there's a couple of uh, points I think that it hinges on. Firstly, we have to look at his confession. Now, that seems quite sketchy to me. To be honest, it doesn't seem sketchy that it never showed up because I think that was just the chaplain doing, uh, you know, just doing his duty, really, of, of keeping it and keeping his um, promise to Tao that he wouldn't, you know, hand over the full confession to the press. I don't, I don't think that's actually... I think that's a convenient way to sort of hang the moniker of a conspiracy on the case. I think the fact that it was sort of no one ever found it and it was hidden away and the details weren't actually given, I think that that does kind of open the door for the conspiracy. But it's not that bit that actually I, I find questionable. It's actually the motive. He apparently wrote in his confession that uh, the uh, the motive was essentially he didn't want his wife to find out that he had a mistress with two children. But, and here's the big but, his wife knew already. She'd already found a letter in the past and knew that she had this uh, lady in Slough with two children. So that completely scrubs the motive. And suddenly that throws it all into a new light for me. I don't know if I can buy that she would have killed herself due to being in a bleak financial situation. I just don't think she would have done that, not with two children. And I think that's where it all falls down. And I think there is the circumstantial evidence... (laughs) Although it is just circumstantial evidence, it is strong and it does all go against Tao. And that does sort of bring you back to when I mentioned about his arrogance. Because, again, that that, that argument is quite strong. Like, why would he have worn like an in, a very obvious clothing, you know, wearing full Quaker outfit to, to, her, to her house if he didn't think, you know, if he was planning to kill her? To me, that seems a strange move to make. But if he was incredibly arrogant and convinced in his own sort of righteousness that or you know that his own belief that if he was dressed in a Quaker garb people just wouldn't question him uh you know that, that then that's why I sort of wonder about his arrogance for me I think he definitely did it I think although the circumstantial evidence is just circumstantial evidence I, I think it's just far too strong and I think one of the the strongest parts actually is is his previous visit where she um, he visited her and then she went to bed feeling ill and was up all night being sick. I think he probably did try and kill her that time as well, and he just got the wrong, uh, the wrong, the wrong poison, uh, or just you know used the poison that wasn't strong enough. Uh, and I think that actually is quite damning evidence against him. Again, it's only circumstantial because no one knows, but I think that's actually quite damning evidence against him. I, I do sort of flip flop because I, I do think the argument that, she, that you know he she just committed suicide. I, I do actually think. That, it is quite a good argument. And then, like I say, that again, another thing that makes me wonder is his financial situation. It wasn't as bleak as it made, it was made out. It was sort of temporarily bleak, but it was potentially going to be solved. So uh, you can argue that his financial situation, you know, like like like, like his defence said, basically he's not a desperate man. He's pretty well off. But he'd been paying her £13 quarterly for a really long time. Perhaps he was just sick of it and perhaps he was like, I'm, I'm just not doing this for the rest of my life because obviously that would have been quite a lot of money. That would have added up with quite a lot of money. So, you know, I still think he had a, a pretty strong uh, motive to kill her um, despite, you know, despite the fact that he, you know, he that he wasn't that destitute. Like I say, like, and to be honest, I mean, the, the most well-off people are usually the greediest. You know, it's not really that surprising. Um, so overall, I think he probably did do it. Maybe I've, I'm not sure I've kind of set out my argument very well there. Maybe it's a bit muddled, but 
but I do think that I think it probably was him. I don't I don't think it was suicide. I think that was quite a good story that he had concocted. And I think it has legs and I think it's definitely strong enough. And, and I wouldn't be upset if anyone sort of was adamant that that was what they believed to happen and argued with me with it. You know, I would say fair enough. You know, I can see why you're arguing that point. But for me, I think it's the, the circumstantial evidence is just a bit too strong. So anyway, if you don't agree with me, if you do think that perhaps she did kill herself, get in touch. Contact at darkhistories.com is the email address, which you can also find in the show notes. Uh, you can also go to darkhistories.com, which is the website, and you'll find all the ways of contacting me there, as well as all the ways of supporting the podcast and getting involved in the community and following the social media, all of that stuff, all in the show notes, all at darkhistories.com. Once again, just a quick reminder, I'm going to be doing the live stream on Wednesday the 31st of May. If you'd like to pop along, that'd be great. Uh, it'd be fun. Say so you're just going to be doing some live drawing so you get to see the black cover drawn. Because I think the front cover is actually already completed and, and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to show that on the stream. But uh, yeah, the back cover, I think, is what's going to be being drawn. And we'll do a little bit of a chat and, you know, they'll, they'll, there's a there's a uh, an area for people to type and chat if you've not been to a live stream before so you know we can communicate and we can have a chat and just have a bit of a Q&A session and it'll be fun so yeah if you'd like to come along that'll be 10 o'clock on Wednesday the 31st of May anyway until then or until then or until two weeks time depending on if you come to the live stream or not take care thanks very much for listening I hope you enjoyed it sleep tight